Ladies and gentlemen, hello. Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Today we have the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Alex Zeshevik. Hello. Hi. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for inviting me. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. We are mutual friends with Maya Ackerman, who linked us up. She's wonderful, and she's she been is. on the show. And now we've had a couple phone calls, really mm -hmm. good phone calls, and so I'm excited to have this in-person conversation. This is great. Cool. Little fire, bit, fire away. A little bit of background on Alex. He has been 24 years now professing an associate dean of graduate studies at Santa Clara University that is down near the San Jose area. He's also a PhD in electrical engineering from Santa Clara University. And also, he is the author of Truth, Beauty, and the Limits of Knowledge. So we have Truth, Beauty, and the Limits of Knowledge. We have, we, in your, the, the course that you're professing about mm -hmm. science and religion, we have a lot to unpack. This is gonna be fun. Mm -hmm. So maybe, I, ha I have to ask this first, because anyone that's been teaching even for like five years or 10 years, I always ask, what have been some of your favorite takeaways from the process of enriching young minds? Uh, it's unpredictable. It's never the same. Uh, however many times you teach that class, it's, a, it's a, not just that one, but that one in particular. It's, it's, a, it's an interactive thing. And, and they ask you questions sometimes you've never thought of. They put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> you put them on the spot as well. Uh, and at the end, they, they write essays, which is really uh, illuminating because sometimes they're very personal about these mm. things. And, and you see uh, the kinds of issues that people have, uh, particularly those who care about religion and have had mixed experiences. So sometimes they, they start out in a traditional way, then they get disillusioned, then they look at it from another Angle, yeah. perspective because they're now all science and engineering students. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's never been boring, I have to say. It's been more than 10 years now that I've been teaching that particular class. I like how you bring yeah. up that there's the interplay between you asking them and putting them on the yeah. spot, and then them being like, well, professor, I have a question. And then, oh, yeah. and then all of a sudden you're like, dang, I haven't heard of that one yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. And they're, they're actually very up to date. I mean, they have their, their, their phones, their laptops exactly. there. So if something happened that morning, uh, they're usually a step ahead of me. You yeah. Know, and, so <laughs> and then I, I really enjoyed how you brought up that the perspective shift. Mm -hmm. we've, we've talked about it on the show, expanding the mind to new dimensions, or some people call mm -hmm. them uh, view quakes. Mm -hmm. uh, so when your mind gets shifted around and you're open to your mind being shifted around like that, it is so fascinating. All of a sudden, one moment you might be like, ah, nothing about religion's good. And then the next mm -hmm. moment, somebody will teach you something about religion, mm -hmm. and you're like, wait, that's actually interesting. Mm -hmm. And then, you, so it's, it's interesting how you can go from no interest to some interest, to a lot of interest, to life changing, to maybe mm -hmm. back to not as interested. It's such a strange, <laughs> yeah. Well, usually as, as you accumulate knowledge, I think your understanding of something becomes more sophisticated. You never quite get back to the same point where you were. Yeah. Uh, yep. Simply because uh, there, there are different levels of, of uh, religion. There's that basic ritualistic part that uh, many people engage in where you don't think very much about what's behind it. And that's something that you can easily grow out of over time, if that's all there is, because there are no questions there. And there are some fundamental issues that you have to resolve, particularly if you're in, in the sciences and in engineering, because uh, there comes a point where you, you can legitimately ask the question, okay, can I believe this and at the same time be consistent with what my profession is? Mm -hmm. And that's really what, what drove the development of that course. So that's yes. a question I ask myself. Can I believe what I would like to believe and be intellectually honest given what I know? Can we and unpack this now since we're here? Let's, let's yeah. go for it. So what was this thesis of yours mm -hmm. that it was like, I believe in some scientific objective yeah. truth, but then if I believe in mm -hmm. religion, it somehow cancels that out, but then I can believe in them together. Yeah, I, th I think uh, it's, it's a common uh, perspective that, that, that science and religion are somehow in conflict. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Uh, if you look at science for what it is today, 
And uh, we, we tend to think in Newtonian terms because that's intuitive and we've learned it that way in school. It's been that way for almost 300 years where you know, apples fall down and never go upwards and, and uh, the second, first and second and third law are all obvious. But physics really hasn't been that way for 100 years. If you look at quantum mechanics, if you look at string theory, all of these strange new discoveries, uh, the, the physical reality is sometimes stranger than the reality you, you hear from uh, religious texts. And the That's fact, so the fact that, that, that it's that way uh, kind of opens up your mind. Uh, what, what, what is that reality that we're talking about? It's not like this one's intuitive, obvious, and this one is weird, and, and they're both strange. <laughs> And then you have to ask yourself, okay, if that's what reality is really like, what should my position be? And that's where the limits of knowledge come into play. Uh, because if science acknowledges that such limits exist in the natural world, that's a great starting point for a conversation because limits of knowledge open the door to the existence of a mystery. Mm -hmm. And if we agree on that, then I think uh, it's a very different and more constructive conversation. Than okay, so we have, we have lots of people that think that we're going to uh, analyze the crap out of existence with science. And then mm. we have the possibility mm. to try and say, okay, we'll analyze as much of it as possible, mm -hmm. but let's leave a little bit open to the possibility that yeah. there are things like string theory and quantum mm -hmm. mechanics yeah. that are actually more complex at times than even religion mm -hmm. is. Yeah. And, and maybe that, that opening up that door actually leaves more ability to have conversation about things that are maybe ethereal mm -hmm. or things that are maybe not in the three-dimensional reality yeah. that we see so I, I, I do see how that actually helps a lot. Um, it does help, I think. It helped me for sure because uh, the moment you open the door to a mystery, uh, the question is not whether or not it exists, but what is it like? And we can disagree on that. Mm -hmm. uh, you could have people who are religious who say that it's a benevolent, beautiful mystery that cares about you, or you could say it's a cold, dark, disinterested one, but it's there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the very first step we need to make because there are many, many people who would deny that. They, they will say exactly what you did. We'll analyze everything. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like counting. You, know, you can count ad infinitum, and every time you do, you're going to miss everything in between two integers. There's a lot there. Yeah, you know? exactly. So yeah. Uh, there's no end to research and discovery, but yeah. that doesn't mean you're going to cover everything. Uh, and we're learning that because we have now come to a point where, where uh, we're tackling systems that are not that simple anymore. We, we started out with the- that, that paradox one more time? The amount of numbers between zero and one mm. is infinity. And then the amount of numbers between zero and infinity mm -hmm. is also infinity. Oh, don't, and, get, don't get me yeah, started but, on that one. But, 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 but yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, there, there are so different that, kinds of infinity. So. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. And so, um, Ron, I want to loop Ron into this because I think, wait, wait, I, ha I have the point first. Let me get the point out first. Mm -hmm. um, Alex mentions how whatever exists outside of the 3D reality, we can either say that it's, it's dark and it's nothingness and like it's totally nothingness. And then other people can make such a mystical and like hypothesis around some yes. what it could be. What do you, uh -huh. what do you Well, I'm on the latter. There is, it isn't dark outside of this 3D reality is, uh, it's quite remarkable. There's, there's, um, it, it's, sometimes I think it's secret. Sometimes I, I can't, uh, you know, I don't want to discuss it too much, but there's, there's clues, there's symbols, it's, uh, it's, it's like a, I'm the star of my own science fiction movie when you uh, think beyond the 3D reality. And people will think you're crazy, but it, it's, it's helped me, if, if anyway, uh, pursue the things that I want to do and not be uh, enslaved, quote unquote, or caught in the matrix. You know, I have to mm. bend time and space and it's, it's, all, in my, it's all in my head. So. Yeah. Th that's where I feel. There is, there is Alex, much beyond this 3D reality. And life is extremely short. These bodies are meat puppets uh, here briefly. 
and the, the truth lies beyond the, uh, mm. the, the dimensions, beyond uh, 3D. That's the key word, truth, uh -huh. uh, which I think uh, all the great physicists have said that uh, we cannot know nature or his law, its laws as they really are. Mm. Uh, we can only answer certain questions that we pose ourselves, yeah, but that's yeah, not yeah. the same thing. Yeah. So uh, if, if that, that, and that's a fundamental uh, metaphysical restriction, if yeah. you will. Ontological. Uh, uh, exactly. Yeah. So uh, that's, that, that's part of what I refer to as the mystery. Uh, the fundamental question that you can ask in science, which is not one that science can answer, is why are the laws the way they are? Because if they're even the tiniest bit different, then you and I are not talking here. We don't exist mm -hmm. as such. I mean, we yeah. really exist on the edge of a razor. Yeah. If the mass of, of an electron and, and a proton, if that ratio changes at the 30th decimal place, everything falls apart. It's that finely mm -hmm. tuned. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, if you're talking about the nature of, of that mystery or truth or whatever, then you have to build it into that question as well. So why are the laws exactly that way? When they could be something totally different, not conducive to life or intelligence at all. I love the example that you give, which is we have, we've evolved on this rock and then we pose the questions that we think are, we frame the world through the question and then we analyze it to come up with a solution. But that's, we're limited to our perception, we're limited yeah. to the way that we structure these questions. Sure. Um, so to actually know what the laws of nature are around us mm -hmm. um, will never be exact. Yeah. Um, it'll be very difficult to figure that out. And then piggybacking off of what Ron mm -hmm. said, Ron really, you know, he's looking for these feelings, these connectivities yeah. spiritually to the outside mm -hmm. of the 3D world, these clues, all these different yeah. things. Do you also feel some of that? Uh, yeah, that's actually where I think religion and art and beauty come into play. They are the intangible mm. part of that reality. Because if you could put everything in, in, in words, then that would be it. Uh, that, there would be no need for other types of art beyond literature. And, you know, New York Times would be your only source of information. That's not true. Uh, part of being human is to go beyond that. And uh, it's, I, I always kind of uh, cringe when I hear these, these uh, reductionist theories that uh, yeah. it's all about matter. It, matter is involved, of course it is. Yeah. But uh, what makes you you? Is it the matter that makes you up? Because there isn't a single molecule in you that was there five years ago. So why are you still you? You tell me. Mm. Mm -hmm. What makes you you? Clearly not just your material makeup. It's the way it's organized. And that's the difference between matter and information. So I, I always give an analogy with, with a, a chess game. So you play a chess game, and then you come and knock down the pieces. What happened to the game? Is it gone? The game itself isn't gone. The pieces are gone. You can replay it with other pieces. Mm -hmm. Or you can replay it in your head. So, Information does not follow the same rules as matter mm -hmm. does. And, and clearly, uh, it, is play, it plays a role in, in defining who we are and, and everything else. I mean, physicists today are speculating that information is in some way superior to matter. Yeah. I mean, there's that famous phrase, it from bit. It from bit. Yes, uh -huh. uh, which means essentially matter from information. Mm -hmm. And uh, matter is where it gets played out, but it's not the essence of, of not just what we are, but what uh, the physical world is. So it seems like then ev the next step of evolution then is information. Uh, who knows? <laughs> I mean, there there's an attack yeah. on information. We, we, we can't lose sight there's, that there's a dark villain uh, among us. When you mentioned art uh, and the importance of mm -hmm. that understanding, I, I also believe, you know, you can't just come right out and say these things. You have to encode it in a poem or a song and get people uh, to mm -hmm. think and um, just apply it. 
I, I'm inspired by uh, the music that I grew up with, the lyrics that I listened to, mm-hmm. and um, but there's also an, a, there's an attack on that creative process, I, in my opinion. You know, I, you know, in my science fiction movie that I was talking about. So yeah. uh, art is, is is vital. I would agree. Yeah. Well, Ron also brings up a really crucial point, which is that we have to encode the the information to get it to the masses. And it's very interesting. We have a lot of other close friends that are doing similar things, but to be very careful with the way that the information is presented. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say like, oh, I had an incredible time on LSD or I went to, Mm -hmm. I did this incredible experience. And then people will literally tell them that like, I don't care, like that's not, that's not it's scary to me. I don't, that's yeah. not interesting to me. And then all of a sudden that information will degrade, that experience, that feeling, mm-hmm. that emotion will degrade, that aliveness for them. So it's really important to package this information. For example, this enlightenment may be about, about quantum computing. What if mm-hmm. you could turn quantum computing into a song, into a mainstream yeah. pop culture song? Right. Yeah. You know, um, so so th- mm-hmm. so these kind of ways to encode information is something that you know we care mm-hmm. about a lot. That's you know on the show you're talking about science and religion, and we're trying to unpack this in as relatable, explain mm-hmm. like I'm five, explain like I'm ten or fifteen um, way possible. So, okay, let's let's touch on this since we're on the subject. Um, the chaos and order. Mm-hmm. We have, let's, why don't you go ahead and tell us about what the, what you've been doing in that space. Chaos is is a, is a word that's often misinterpreted because uh, the implication is that it's complete disorder. In fact, the modern understanding of of chaos and system theory is that it's hidden order. It looks random by many standards, uh, but if you frame the data in a certain way, all of a sudden you see some kind of meta order appear. So chaos is really a mix of order and disorder. It, uh, on the surface, and on the surface only, it looks random. And, and it seems to be one of the uh, key mechanisms in nature for the emergence of complexity. So this whole idea, and this, this is one of the, I mean, you and I talked about this debate uh, between uh, pro-Darwinists and, and, and those who are more religiously minded about whether something like evolution that has a random component can actually have some sort of direction. Well, randomness is really not the enemy. Randomness is what jolts you a little bit so that you get out of your local uh, equilibrium and explore a little further. Mm -hmm. That's what we're discovering in in the world of complex systems. So so chaos is really not a bad word anymore. It was for a couple thousand years, but nowadays it's it's a fascinating phenomenon. The the butterfly effect, I mean, uh, it sounds like an exaggeration, but literally, if you look at it mathematically, it's a system that's infinitely sensitive mm-hmm. to its uh, initial conditions. So you change them at whatever decimal you like, eventually there will be some macroscopic effect. Yeah. So the whole story with the butterfly effect was a remark that Edward Lawrence made. He was the guy who discovered the phenomenon. And he said that the movements of a butterfly's wings somewhere in the Amazon could affect the long-term pattern of weather in China. Mm -hmm. And technically speaking, he was correct Mm -hmm. because uh, it it is a chaotic system. And if you change something at whatever decimal point, eventually you'll see the difference. I like to make this relatable example for that Mm -hmm. as well, which is if you smile Mm -hmm. at someone when you're walking down the street or doing something Mm -hmm. in the service or retail industry and they notice your smile and they smile Mm -hmm. back, they will then affect the next person and then mm-hmm. that person will affect the next person. There's this whole, all of a sudden that person's calling their family in Norway and then the, they're happier, the person in <laughs> Norway's happier than the person in Norway's interacting yeah. with other people on the streets. So there's an insane connectivity mm-hmm. a- across all of it for even humans as well. Uh, True. Uh, However, there we don't have a model, so we cannot Mm -hmm. technically speak of chaos. We don't we don't have a clue how to model all that. But uh, you have a similar conclusion coming from a very different angle from quantum mechanics, the so-called EPR paradox, which uh, 
Einstein posed back in the 30s, which essentially tells you that particles, any two particles that ever interacted throughout the history of the universe are somehow entangled. They could be in different galaxies right now. And if they're in that state of entanglement, you measure one in one galaxy, the other one in the other galaxy is immediately its opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, Einstein couldn't buy that. He was actually uh, philosophically opposed mm -hmm. to that interpretation of quantum mechanics. So he mm -hmm. spent the better part of his last 20 years trying to undermine it. And this paradox was supposed to do the trick. And it so happens that he was wrong. It took another 20 some years to uh, construct an experiment that would test this. And Einstein was wrong. That, that what he called spooky action at a distance actually exists. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, that's why they call quantum mechanics a non-local theory, which is another uh, fancy way of saying what you just said, that things are connected in ways that we don't necessarily understand. Mm -hmm. And if that's really the case, then uh, the, the scope of what we can know is inherently limited. You don't even know what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Because if, if there's a global phenomenon that depends on everything that's out there and we only see a slice of it, how could you possibly see anything but randomness there? I mean, what kind of rule or pattern or would you expect to see? And I find that phenomenon fascinating because it's, it's been beaten to death. It's been tested and tested to the point where they now, some 10 years ago, looked at two particles that were 11 kilometers away, which is a galactic distance for two particles. And the effect was still there, not diminished in any way. So we can uh, safely say that such a thing exists. What it means, we don't quite know. But we've, we've kind of scratched the surface on that. And what we see is much stranger than, than what you hear from you know, some theologians, particularly those who are a little more sophisticated. Does the quantum entanglement across parts of the universe, does that have something to do with symmetry and asymmetry? Uh, <laughs> in a very indirect way, uh, but uh, symmetry has always been a tool that scientists have used to break ties, essentially. If, if you don't have an intuitive feel as to what's going on and you have multiple candidates for a theory, you're often going to go with the one that's the most aesthetically pleasing, and we like symmetry. Yeah. So a lot of uh, modern science and modern physics in particular was based on symmetries which were mathematical largely because we thought that's cool. And then we found things we didn't bargain for uh, just following that lead. So the beauty as a criterion in science has been remarkably effective. We have no explanation for why because it's a subjective thing. We like symmetry possibly for biological reasons because you know, living organisms tend to be more symmetric than um, non-living matter. So it, it matters to you whether you, you know, mm -hmm. to our ancestors it did, whether it's a rock or it's a bear, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're kind of preconditioned to like it, but the fact that this could now be the key to unlocking some secrets of, of the universe, that, that's much more than we ever bargained for. And why that's the case is, is quite, I don't have an answer to it, but it fascinates me. So understanding symmetry and asymmetry could be a key to understanding our universe. It turns out that it's been very helpful because if you look at modern particle physics, and even before that, uh, when Mendeleev uh, came up with the periodic system, uh, about half of the elements were known at the time. And he just kind of filled in the blanks and said, this, it, there must be something there. And lo and behold, there was. Uh, so, uh, the same thing happened with the omega minus particle, which is, uh, it, it, that's a long story, but if, if they found a bunch of particles which when you graph them in a certain way, uh, fill out a, a, a region very symmetrically and then there's one missing at the bottom. And Murray Joel Mann, who discovered that phenomenon, said, well, there must be something there. And a couple of years later, they looked for it, they found that famous omega minus. So, Symmetry has been uh, really good to us, uh -huh. but if it was just symmetry, uh, we, again, we wouldn't be here. Because mm -hmm. if there was perfect symmetry between matter and antimatter, that would all cancel each other out at the very beginning of the universe. And in fact, we are here because there was a slight, slight excess of matter over antimatter, one in a million, let's say, under those conditions. Mm -hmm. And so symmetry breaking and symmetry yeah. together yeah. are the key.
Well, one of the keys. Who, yeah. knows, who knows what the real key is, but and for us and our discovery, yes. The slow genetic evolutions as well are breaks in symmetry. Um, you could say so, and yes. And increases mm -hmm. in chaos. Uh, I'm not sure I would put it that way. There's a term that scientists use it called frozen accidents, mm. where mm -hmm. uh, in principle you could have many different, like if you, if you put a pencil on, on the desk upside down, Theoretically, it could fall anywhere with like the equal quarter likelihood as right. well. Same thing. But a pencil too. is even more. Oh. Uh, put it on its tip. Any it direction. could go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So the laws themselves allow all sorts of outcomes. But if you actually do that, it'll fall in one particular direction, and after that, that'll determine the evolution uh, of whatever the system is for the foreseeable future. So, but it's an accident. In fact, it didn't have to happen that way. Evolution is kind of like that too. There are lots of things that didn't have to happen but did and influenced the way different species evolved. But that's the random piece to it. But then there is a lawful piece because uh, information is transmitted quite lawfully from one generation to the next with a little bit of distortion with mutations and things like that. But there is order mixed with that kind of disorder. And the fact that something like us comes out at the tail end of all that is fascinating. Think yeah. about it, through us, the universe is aware of itself. Yes. Which isn't shabby at all. So yeah. it's, a, it's absolutely amazing, yeah. yeah. And that we can state as a fact. Yeah. So, uh, and what yeah. happens after that remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. Hopefully civilization thrives and prospers, <laughs> yeah. Yes, you, yeah. these days you, you have your doubts, but. <laughs> I'm sure they did in the past as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. We want to believe this is part of the learning process, you know, yeah. to be positive. And, um, I agree. But, I, but I hear you, the doubts that we would have. Well, the, the problem is that I think, uh, and, and this is, uh, I don't want to rant uh, <laughs> against social media, but mm. uh, from the Enlightenment to this day, there was a, a, a kind of consensus as to what constitutes truth mm -hmm. and what standards have to be met before you can call something a fact. And, mm. and because social media allowed, I mean, they have their good sides, but because they allowed people to kind of connect with those who are like-minded, they, 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 they now have the opportunity to, to ignore those standards and to live in a reality of their own, which is not an objective one. So it's almost an undoing of the enlightenment, if you will. Confirmation bias. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is that two and two are still four and that the laws of nature uh, as we know them are, are, are still pretty solid. And, and that's not up for debate. Yeah. What we can debate are interpretations of certain of scientific things, exactly. but not, not all facts are, are, are debatable. And, and, yeah. um, and this started before. I mean, this started with the postmodern movement Correct. When, when they yeah. Correct. started relativizing math as a human construct. There is a human element to math, but two and two are still four. Yeah, yeah. So let's not push and, that too and far. gravity yeah. 9.8 meters per second squared yeah. on the surface of the earth yeah. and mo mo molecular composition yeah. of water is objectively true we know yes. what it is yes. so th there's no postmodernist discussion about those things but then mm -hmm. all these different interpretations of yeah. subjective realities of course are yeah. and sure um, so, mm -hmm. so mathematics is truly the, the universal language in my opinion uh, uh, that's a slippery slope uh, let me tell you why uh, because Mathematics generally, uh, at least as it's practiced today, is based on axioms. Mm -hmm. And axioms can be anything at all. Those are things we choose. And to the Greeks, uh, many centuries ago, axioms were self-evident things. Uh, but not today. Today they can be anything at all yeah. that is just taken to be true, and then we go from there. That's the human element in math. Uh, so we do get to pick our axioms. And, and, and yeah, once yeah. we do, because you have multiple geometries, you have Euclidean geometry, which you learned in school, but then you have non-Euclidean geometry, which has a different axiom, mm. and it's, it's totally unlike that. Uh, so there are many maths. I stand corrected. Uh, all uh, the, <laughs> the, the idea of first principles thinking in mm -hmm. general with axioms, yeah. axiomatic thinking, mm -hmm. 
that style of thinking has been lost over the last 500 years mm -hmm. due to this explosion, especially in the last 10 years of technology and social media. Now there's no mm -hmm. axiomatic first principles thinking. And now it's just everything that is said online mm -hmm. is just taken like it's truth. Yeah. And so this is, like you said, in the past, it used to be something sacred, something that yeah. um, it's not anymore. And um, to some people it is, but to a lot it isn't. Yeah, and that's, that's really the battle of the 21st century. You know, will facts survive as such? Because uh, once you get into these kinds of uh, fictional constructs, then anything goes. And uh, a mark of an inconsistent mm -hmm. mathematical system is that everything is a theorem. Everything is true, in other words. So one way to prove consistency in mathematics is to find at least one statement that isn't true in that system. Then then you're going somewhere. So uh, to, to kind of get back to those fundamental, and that's a matter of education, really. Yeah, it is. Uh, and it's parent yeah. as number one. Yeah. yeah. But it's education not just uh, formally through schools, but I think also, uh, I think the media have a certain yeah. responsibility. responsibility yeah. uh, not just to make money, but to, to increase enlightenment, if you will, Exactly. If you yeah. the second that you start propagating information on the internet, yeah. you're putting that into the eyes of children. Yes. And when you're putting it into the eyes of children, and then you're running advertisements that are monetizing your company and paying for them, but yeah. then some of the ads are malevolent ads, and some of the mm -hmm. content. Again, we don't have a philosophical or an ethical responsibility baked into us mm -hmm. to want to bring forth goodness through mm -hmm. social media. We bring mm -hmm. forth whatever we want. Yeah, exactly. And the prerequisite for a democracy is an educated, reasonably educated population. Yeah, that's exactly. And it's getting more and more so because you're going to be voting about things that are technical. Yeah. One of these days, uh, there will be things like, uh, you know, related to nanotechnology, to cloning, to God knows what else. Yeah. Uh, we're already talking about data security and things like that. And those are things that are hard to understand. Yeah. Even if you are educated. I mean, yes. it's hard. Yes. And explaining it on a level where the average person can at least get a sense of it uh, will help. Otherwise, the whole paradigm is, is vulnerable because then you, you have an uninformed population that's supposed to vote on issues that are crucial. And they won't even know what hit them until, until later. So yeah. That, it's really important. That's a major point. Yeah. We have so many of these exploding technologies that are coming into our world mm -hmm. and we have people that are just even educated people struggle with understanding these sure. things well-educated people do because well-educated people sometimes go vertically deep into one thing and mm -hmm. then you pull the blockchain token out and they're like mm -hmm. what's that and then you pull the quantum computing token out and mm -hmm. they're like what's that and then you pull the cloning yeah. and genetic engineering mm -hmm. tokens out and they're like what's that mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you, you, we have to vote on these things we have to yeah. talk about these things we have to make these things relatable for people so that yeah. this is this is where that's a major point and I, I really want to put a big flag there mm -hmm. yeah Ron wink <laughs> um, because if we, you know, I would really like to unpack that because yeah. what do we do? What do you think we should do moving forward to ensure that people get that education that's needed well, in order to have these conversations and vote yeah. in the... But for one thing, I think education cannot be one dimension. You said dive down deep into one thing. That's necessary, but not sufficient. If yeah. you do that and don't have a context for it, ethical and social and so on, uh, you won't be able to help very much because you could be a brilliant scientist or a mathematician or whatnot, uh, but you will have no control over where your discovery goes. And I think that that's why I'm, I'm so big on, on Jesuit education because for like 400 years, mm -hmm. they just won't let you graduate without that. Yeah. Uh, at Santa Clara, we have a core curriculum, which is about 20 some percent of, of the overall coursework. Uh, regardless of what your major is. So you just cannot get out of that school without writing properly, without thinking properly, without taking a class on ethics, without some understanding of other things. And then when you're broad like that, then things can come easier because all of these problems that we're talking about are really complex. You cannot really solve them just looking at it from one angle.
You, and you have to not just be able to do it, you have to enjoy doing that. Exactly. And there's, there's a lot of fun in doing that. Yeah. It's a, you, can, you can do one thing really well, but eventually it'll, it'll get stale. Yeah. And uh, that's part of the joy of discovery is to vary things a little bit. Yeah, that multidisciplinary yeah. approach, what we celebrate uh, on the show. With, so with one caveat, the multidisciplinary is wonderful, but you have to be uh, well-grounded in at least one. Yeah. You cannot be shallow across the board. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's uh, the French have a word for it. They call it dilettante. Dilettante. <laughs> dilettante, meaning you're basically uh, superficial in everything and, yeah, and yeah. You, know, yeah. you don't know. So you have to do it from a position of strength and then branch out mm. according to your mm. liking. But yeah. uh, so that, and that, that's actually why I teach the class the way I teach it. Uh, there ha there's a technical piece to it. There, there are projects, there's an exam. You actually have to learn chaos theory before you can have an opinion on chaos theory. Yeah. Because it's a, it's a subtle thing. And it, the easiest thing in the world is to get uh, uh, the wrong interpretation. Analogies are nice, but uh, analogies will only take you so far. It's mm -hmm. the introduction to the problem. Um, yeah. The real deal is, is to understand what that really means. Because when I tell you something is infinitely sensitive, you won't think twice, you'll take my word for it. Butterflies can do whatever they want. Well, not really. Uh, chaos theory, not every system is chaotic. Some are, some are not. And even if they're capable of chaos, there are certain conditions that need to be in place for that to happen. And under other conditions, they'll behave like any other system. So understanding that gives you the perspective to expand. And that's why I think that, that uh, scientific education and this broader philosophical, uh, if you will, spiritual, artistic education should go hand in hand. Uh, because uh, separating things is, 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 is just a convenience, actually. It's, it's what the brain likes to do to, to minimize the blood flow, basically, separate categories. It's easier that way. It's uh, metabolically speaking cheaper, but the real thing is to mix them up. And I thrive on that. That's why mm -hmm. I love interdisciplinarity but from a position of strength. Yeah. You have to know certain things really well first. Mm -hmm. I love how you bring up the Jesuit education. That's mm. so important. It's, just, what, why did we lose the polymath? Why did we lose the, the curriculum of at least some philosophy and at least mm. some ethics and at least some, um, some other sorts of like speaking and, and mm. etiquette and business and manners? Why because there's we... a dark villain <laughs> that wants to control us. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> the it, Jesuits. It, well, it doesn't make money in the short term. Uh, so if you, if you want somebody to fit in perfectly into, uh, and I think that paradigm might change eventually, but if the you want- The creative class is being yeah. born, yeah, yeah. Yes, because I think what, what separates Silicon Valley from much of the rest of the world is that innovation piece. And innovation, it, yeah. it, uh, it just, it doesn't fall into your lap. You have to, uh, it's, it's there, but you have to be ready to do that. And uh, you know, to connect the dots, you have to have enough dots and they need to be sufficiently diverse, and then you'll think out of the box. I mean, it's, it's, it's a phrase that everybody uses, thinking out of the box, but how, how do you do that? You know, to connect things that other people didn't connect, there has to be a big spectrum of things out there for you yeah. to connect. And I think eventually, and I, I really hope so, that this educational model will survive. You know, literacy survived in the dark ages in monasteries. Uh, I think this broad Renaissance spirit will survive in pockets, and then one day, it'll come back into its own because you really need uh, to know many things today to be functional. Uh, and you know, moving forward in the next 50 years, it'll be only more, it won't be less. The world is already really complicated because it's now very connected. You know, 50 years ago, you could talk about local crises. Today, there are no local crises. Something happens in, in Southeast Asia, you're gonna feel it somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, because the world has changed. Mm -hmm. And then how do you think about that? Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. I grew up in Europe. We studied only European history, mm. which, which is a, a mistake. Mm -hmm. We knew virtually nothing about the Far East, for example, exactly. Japanese, Chinese, yeah. Indian. We did such a little bit of world yeah. history, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Th that's really important because history repeats itself. 
uh, in, it never quite identically, but Correct. yes, it's, it's because history yeah. is a product of the human nature. Exactly. Yeah. And that hasn't changed in a couple yeah. thousand years. Yeah, yeah. It's so, not going to change. Yeah. I'm happy that yeah. you're identifying the, the importance of creativity and innovation, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that this is a, those sort of, I call them um, Rube Goldberg moments, the mm -hmm. Rube Goldberg machine, this sort of complicated energetic output of the body, heart, and mind out mm -hmm. into the world of something creative is very unique. It happens once, right? Mm -hmm. We birthed simulation into the world. It mm -hmm. happened once, yep. one birth of this yep. project. And then um, other things like taking clothes and folding t-shirts, mm -hmm. folding t-shirt, folding t-shirt that's a repetitive task mm -hmm. that's right in the in the crosshairs of software yeah thank you eric weinstein and so because of that mm -hmm. that is the essence of job retraining mm -hmm. get out of the crosshairs of software well and get into the rube goldberg moments so that way you can birth out your book or your video mm -hmm. or your whatever yeah. your thing is and into the world, this idea, and actually build it. Um, and then the, the breadth and some depth of, of, of information and in the way that we see the world. So there's, there's, this, um, there's this, I just posted this and you touched on this, I wanted to mention it. The world is so complex that I spend as much of my time possible learning. Mm -hmm. Because I, I can't, I can't imagine what my life would be like if I spent less time learning. Because if I spent less time reading and watching very smart people and engaging with very smart people and learning directly from them. <laughs> Thank you for you're, that. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> if, if, if we did less of this, we would learn yeah. less. Yeah. And if we learn less, then we, we leave ourselves with less of an understanding of the sure. world. And we need more of an understanding of the world in order to actually yeah. help pass that understanding down to other yeah. people, other kids. I agree, but that's hard. That's what I call an unstable equilibrium. You have, in, in my world of control systems, you have two kinds of equilibria. One is like the bottom of a hole. You don't have to do anything. You're going to fall in there on your own. The other one is on top of a hill. You have a heck of a view from there, but you're fragile. The tiniest thing can... So what you're suggesting is living on top of that hill. Uh, people don't like to do that. Uh, they fight wars rather than change their mind or read a book. Uh, today, to this day. Bookmark uh, that right yeah. there. Uh, but it's true. <laughs> I mean, that's the definition of fanaticism, if you will, because you're fanatically defending a set of beliefs that you don't want to not change necessarily, but just question. Uh, I, I can tell you for, I, I was, uh, I teach my class in, in India, among other places, and in Calcutta, they took me once to the place where Mother Teresa worked. Mm. And uh, I had a chance to speak to one of the nuns who, who lived with her. Actually, she shared a room with her. So I asked her, among other things, okay, well, did she ever have doubts given the horrific place where she worked. Yeah. And she said, yes, every day. Every day, yeah. Every day, but yeah. her faith would prevail. Yeah. So it's not about eliminating doubts, it's about prevailing over them. Exactly. And, yeah. those are two, and those who fight the wars don't question those things. They don't have doubts. They don't even get to that phase. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, mm -hmm. you're looking at somebody who has been a role model, uh, certainly of the 20th century, like Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. And believe me, if you go to that place, yeah. You will understand why. Yeah. It's a horrific place. Uh, and the fact that she spent decades there, it's, uh, you have to ask the question, how can somebody even do that? Yes. Let alone voluntarily do voluntarily, that. Voluntarily, you know? yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and that's the answer. Wow. Uh, so, so it's a question, of, of, question of, uh, of, of debating it with yourself and others all the time. That's, that's a full-time job. That's why I say it's on top of a hill because you can't stop. If you stop, you'll slowly roll down and you'll find your little equilibrium and you won't care about mm -hmm. the rest of the world and then, then you can live in your little bubble. I really like mm -hmm. that. There's, the, there's this crevice that you fit into, this yeah. hole. Well, I mean, think of it this way, just a little ho a hole where mm -hmm. you go up the wall and you go back down. Yeah. Or yeah. 
the yeah, peak. Yeah, correct, or at the peak, exactly. Yeah. So That's unstable we, versus stable. Exactly, yeah, yeah. and the, the stable is, Easy. Kind of, we, can, we can say steeped in ignorance. Yeah. And so when, when, we're, when we're here, it's very... It's appealing, it's easy. <laughs> it's appealing, it's easy. It's, how, how can we be so satisfied with knowing that we know so little? That's where the Dunning-Kruger effect comes <laughs> in. Because we're down here, but we think that we know yeah. a lot. And so then we don't hustle. But when we get here, when we're very yeah. unstable, we, because we're learning more and more about the earth and about humanity yeah. and the social fabric and the, and the intellectual fabric and the technological fabric, we're all the way up here. In, from up here, we realize that we know nothing. And then at any yeah. point, if we're you know, doing something and then we get bumped off, it's really, you know, it's steep. You got to really hustle to, to get yeah. back up when you get bumped off exactly. like that. I've been bumped off what? so many times. <laughs> we, th that's that's the 15 minute mark 45 we're at 45 yeah okay. so 15 left all right i'm putting our hourglass on the table oh, nice. wow oh my gosh but when how did alex how did we do that how did we get through no way that was so fast <laughs> yeah. oh my gosh time flies yeah but when you when you think about what you just said uh, all the great ones like einstein heisenberg all of these guys had a sense of humility because they knew so much yes they touched kind of the outer limits of knowledge, yes. and, and it's the mediocrities that are that are the hardliners. They are the ones who worry me. They're the ones who have n no questions anymore. Everything is set. Did you oh, know that wow. uh, in 1890, uh, the German patent office was almost closed because they claimed there was nothing more to find out? <laughs> oh, and this was right. The uh, hubris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Around 1890, yeah. And right around that time, quantum mechanics and, 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 and oh, relativity yeah. theory changed physics. But it was truly the perception that, you know, we've nailed it all. Newton's <laughs> laws prevail. Thermodynamics is in charge. We've solved it all. Oh so just gosh. the recognition that that'll never happen is a first step. And, and, and then the next step is to enjoy that. Because I, I used to be... I, I, Technical areas control theory. You're right. So, you know, to enjoy you know. that it's totally cool. To, it's so funny to even have the hubris to say, oh, we know everything, close the patent office. But then yeah. to say that we know we know we will never know yeah. everything. Yeah. So because of that, let's yeah. be cool with whatever exists. And that is the beginning of every religious tradition, if you will. That humility to accept the fact that there is a mystery out mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm. and there are certain things that, and, and secondly, that, that it's a good thing. Because if you lived in a Newtonian universe, I think you'd blow your brains out because that'd be the most boring, predictable universe imaginable. This one, I mean, predictable. Uh, it could be for the good or bad, but yeah. at least there's hope, you know? <laughs> you have no idea what will happen. And that's, that's, I think, what makes us human as well, the possibility to, to engage that. And I, wanna, I wanna ask you about this as we come on our, on our way out. How about the importance of starting with science, with mm. education for children. We have yeah. the parent that's kind of this deity for the child once they're born into the world. We have this community, we have these mm -hmm. teachers. We don't have this objective book of reality that we pass to the child. We yeah. don't say that your heart beats about 100,000 times a day, mm -hmm. the molecular composition of water is this, the gravity is this, yeah. two plus two is four, right? We don't really give them this, this objective book at a young age. Mm -hmm. We don't have the parents give it to them. Yeah. Um, why don't we start with that platform? Well, I think schools do, kind of. Kind of. Uh, uh, yeah. But it's not reinforced. Uh, yeah. Society yeah. doesn't reinforce yes. it. That's where the real reinforcement needs to happen, through, through media, through whatever these kids yeah. listen to in their spare time. Yeah. Somebody tells you science is cool, like Carl Sagan did in, in, in the old days, and yeah. you know, people like that. Or even earlier when, when the space race was on, that it was cool to be a rocket scientist, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, nowadays it's cool to make money, and it was always cool to make money, but now it's particularly cool uh, to make money. And to own a sports car and a yeah. fancy watch. Yes. And, uh, and then what, you know? Yeah, because uh, at, that's what uh, uh, I think Schopenhauer said that, that at the end of this, you can only escalate, escalate, escalate. At the end of that lies boredom. Yep. Uh, there's a famous story about uh, Tolstoy, who, who at the time was uh, the greatest writer of his age. He was super rich, a, a Russian count. He could apparently write a week on his estate and not reach the end. 
He, at one point, contemplated suicide for about two years. He didn't know what to do with himself because he had accomplished everything. Because if you don't have this additional spiritual peace, yeah. uh, if you're only in the material world and, and success and all that, it'll come to a point where you will saturate. And then what? So, you see people at a certain point in their career uh, look to philanthropy, to things like that. That's, it's that instinct. What next? And it's so much better if you start out with it than to find that out at the, at, at the end of yes, the game. Yes, yes. Start is, yeah. out with having yeah. uh, the, the teaching process yeah. to children, be that yeah. we are using money as a tool for us to achieve yes. our ideas and our goals in life. Mm -hmm. We are just using it as a tool along the way yes. that the materialistic possessions yeah. will not bring you happiness, but providing mm -hmm. value to the world yeah. will bring you happiness. Mm -hmm. We will provide these great experiences of being mm -hmm. alive to other people, yeah. as in, like it costs money to to yeah. to, to to maybe uh, go skiing or to or to uh, you Absolutely. know do some thrilling activities and mm -hmm. stuff. But we will provide those for everyone that when they want to yeah. do it. But really, providing value for people yeah. first and foremost is this crucial right. pillar. Because money you can lose, but uh, the one thing nobody can take away from you are your experiences. Uh, I, I mentioned this to you. I, I've spent an ungodly amount of money. Uh, on travel for the last 20 some years with mm. my wife and my kids. Mm -hmm. And that for somebody is money gone. Uh, but the experiences, just experience the world. And the world is a beautiful place. Yes. And uh, I saw this with my kids. I think it's also transformational. It's so transformational. Uh, when they went to Japan for the first time, they, they, they saw a place that works in a totally different way yeah. perfectly. Yeah. And then that yeah. tells you, well, there are many ways to do this. Do this. Yes. And immediately you're inoculated against these uh, uh, kind of monolithic theories that say yes. there's one and yes. only one way to do yes. things. No, yes. there are many ways to do things. And, and to this day, they, you know, they will go to Japan any time, and, and so will I, I mean, it, because it's a truly aesthetic culture. Yeah, it's, it's, it's it a is special a very place. Culture. Yes, they yes. pay attention to everything, and, yes. and we cannot emulate that. But the recognition that something like that is possible, possible. is a first step for us to change. Yeah the way we can yeah. as a society, and, and we can. I think you measure a society not by what it is at a certain point in time, but what it could be. Yeah. And we have the resources to be anything. This is the richest country on earth, where we really shouldn't have poverty at all, where certain things should be acknowledged as human rights. I mean, when you, when you look at what the Founding Fathers said with the pursuit of happiness, to me, that means uh, quality education, that means Healthcare. So, how can you be fully happy if you have to worry about those things all your life? All the time. Yeah. 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 Uh, and they, they were, all of them, Jefferson in particular, but all of them were really followers of the Enlightenment. They were a product of the Enlightenment. They really put into practice what the French Revolution theorized about. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of forgetting that. We're, we're, we're ossifying that statement. What pursuit of happiness does not necessarily just reduce to money? it reduces to other things, uh, and uh, uh, we, should, we should be aware of that. And that's why I think the system of education uh, is the key to how we do that. Exactly. We can't agree on a curriculum that's universal for the entire country. We cannot agree on, on three great books that everybody mm -hmm. has to read. Mm -hmm. You cannot democratize education to that point. Not that early, I think. Uh, maybe I'm kind of a product of, of a bygone era. <laughs> But a little Maybe bit of can. dictatorship in yeah, education yeah, is yeah, good. Yeah. And then you kind of earn your stripes. And yeah, yeah, exactly. I tell my students, the sophomores, that democracy stops at that door. By the time they're seniors and take that science and religion class, we talk. But not, not at the beginning, because uh, they need to learn a few things, and, and that's not negotiable. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah. It, but if that's the truth, then that <clears throat> yeah. that democracy stops at the door. Well, in my class. <laughs> but but I, I think that that same yeah. thing applies to really to anyone that's trying to profess something to teach it to other people. Because mm -hmm. if you're coming into a pedagogy and you're coming in, you're totally welcome to be skeptical. But if you're coming in, you got to give it your all, especially from a very young age, and learn mm -hmm. about these basic fundamental objective truths yeah. to move forward in the world. You bring up going and traveling with your family. Yeah. You you gave your children one of the best gifts yeah. a parent can give their kids. Which and myself is, in the process. And yourself <laughs> in the process, which yeah. is literally taking their minds and saying, look, 
the way that these humans work over on this part of the yeah. globe is different than the way they work yeah. over here, but it's also similar in some mm -hmm. ways. But to be able to see that on different parts of the yeah. earth shows you that there are different ways to yeah. live. I was thinking about a child being raised on Market Street in mm -hmm. San Francisco, and I was just thinking about what it would be like to have lived on Market Street for like 20 years or something and see like hyper techies, hyper homeless, hyper techies, yeah. hyper homeless. And then, you know, you maybe go to Tokyo mm -hmm. and then you're like, there are no homeless. There's no, <laughs> and then, and everything is so yeah. aesthetic on time, yeah. Yeah. Um, fast, um, yeah. beautiful. It's like, I, well, the real place is Kyoto. Kyoto. Yeah. 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 I mean, I like Tokyo too, but Kyoto, if you want uh, the ultimate aesthetic, yeah. That, yeah. that's something else. But. And, and, and yeah. so, so, okay, as we come to um, close, let's, let's see, let's make sure we've had as much as we can. Yeah, we've had we've had as much as we can, I think. Let's let's ask you a couple questions. Do you have do you have a point about what we've been talking about that you want to that comes to mind that you think's really important to address about what you've been learning and about something important to take home? I want I'm going to ask you a couple of these simulation questions. At, at uh, in, in what regard? Uh, like one of these like something really important from your research, uh, hmm. from your studies and from what you've been teaching. Uh I think some humility to, uh, uh, I don't think uh, what I'm currently thinking is the end of the line. Yes. I think it'll change Yes. and it'll change as I learn more and there's no end to that. And I think the, the part that I learned over the years is to enjoy the process because yeah. it used to frustrate the hell out of me. Uh, I, I, when I first heard of Gödel's theorem, which really undermines mm. math and makes it imperfect, I was actually un, uh, quite unhappy about it. And I said, wow, this, this was my perfectly built universe and all of a sudden, mm -hmm. you know, math has issues. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but eventually you, you turn that on its head and, and you, you start finding beauty in that. And, yeah. and this, the, the fact that reality will surprise you all the time becomes a good thing because it could go either way, good or bad, but it's not predictable. And predictability is what kills us because yeah. there's no hope, there's no yes. room for Surprise. For change, surprise, yeah. for, for every, every form of beauty is somehow related to surprise. Yeah. Something yeah, new. True. Yeah. Slightly different. Slightly really. different, yeah. And beauty is, I, 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 I harp on beauty because that's universal to humans. I mean, you, uh, as much as I've traveled, almost every place has a, a certain aesthetic that we can understand, although we may be totally different from that culture. Yes. Uh, because we, at the end of the day, we're all human and have the same modes of perception. So certain things resonate regardless of how much you know about a culture. That's that first impression. Now, if you want to go deeper, then you have to learn about what that thing means or something. But just the visual piece, I never, I never get enough of that because, uh, it, yeah. as I said, the world is a beautiful place if you keep your eyes open. Yeah. And there's this, this thing that I learned from my Jesuit friends, they call it the sacrament of the present moment. Mm. The present is the only reality that you have access to. Yeah. And we often ignore that and constantly anticipate or think about the past. Yes. yes. And beauty is what plugs you into the present because it's there. You cannot yeah. avoid it. It's, it, it's yeah. your most direct contact with the present moment. And I yes. think therefore with whatever greater reality is out there. That's why I yes. push it so hard. The full energetic immersion of In the now. every cell and ability of your body to perceive mm -hmm. into the moment. Yes. yes. And when we pierce each <laughs> moment with all of that mind, heart, soul, everything, yeah. moment after moment, we will yeah. find endless yeah. abundance and and yeah. in breath and in being alive sure. and hopefully we have our basic water, food, shelter, yeah. et cetera, met. But so. every mystical tradition will tell you that same thing. Exactly. All of those who yeah. experienced that talked about this timeless moment. Yes. And even Einstein's theory allows for something like that. There's a, if you were able to move at the speed of light, time would stop for you. Yeah, yeah. We can't because our, we, we have non-zero yeah. mass, so our mass would blow up to infinity. But... Theoretically, such a reference point exists. And maybe you can plug into it in different ways through art. Through, through information. Through, through, yeah, inf information is something that we don't understand yeah, very well yeah, yet, yeah. but it has its laws and its rules, 
And uh, I mean, there's a, there's a, an interesting book. Let's um, let's let's. Uh, I want to I want to make sure we get to these questions. Sure. What's um, so I want to I want to ask this one especially because you brought up humility. Humility mm -hmm. is so important. Um, what do you think is the deepest emotion you've ever felt? I think love. Uh, that's that's the universal standard for all human beings. But uh, uh, and and there's a difference between love and infatuation. I think infatuation is a hormonal thing. It happens, comes and goes. Uh, real love is hard work. Uh, and that's why I think family is important and things and friends. Uh, and that that's usually uh, not a smooth process. Mm. Uh, and and that too. Uh, is something you would like to kind of idealize, but reality won't allow that because we all have different personalities. It's easy to love someone from a distance. Uh, oh, it's yeah. A little harder if you share, you know, Close living quarters, quarters yeah. but, uh, and that's the real test. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, if you manage to experience or perhaps uh, provide unconditional love, which we yeah. tend to do to our kids, that's something. How about, all right, so we're out of time, so we'll have to go quick with these. What, do you think we're alone in the cosmos? Um, in, meaning as an intelligent species? Mm -hmm. um, I can't say. I mean, statistically, it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question for us is, are we the only child or not? Would that mm -hmm. really matter to uh, you? <laughs> you know? are, are we or do we have siblings? Uh, I don't know. Uh, do we uh, have uh, siblings? I like that yeah. way. I like the phrase. But the, way. the point is, there's, there should be a parent to all. There should be a parent to all, yeah. and, what, and what is that parent? Yeah. We, well, that's yeah. for that's a question for the ages, but that, I, I that's where, where all the, the, the great spiritual traditions begin. Do because we have parents care. cosmic siblings? I like yeah. I like that way, cosmic yeah. siblings. And would we even yeah, know how to good. find them? How do we find our cosmic yeah. siblings? Yeah. Because yeah. we yeah. think in, in in terms of our uh, uh, Carl Sagan. I don't know if you read Cosmos. There was a movie afterwards, uh, also, where he assumed that uh, we would at least agree on math, which is not a given. Yeah. They could have a different math because our math is, is a product of the way the human brain processes certain things. Axioms are not a must. That's just how we like to organize information. And given those axioms, math as we know it follows, but who knows you know, in some other galaxy what that would look like. Do you think that some of our cosmic siblings are advanced enough to have simulated the universe that we live in? I have no idea, to be honest with you. Okay. I'm not that big on science fiction. I'm perfectly happy with the fact the that, that w through us, the universe is self-aware. Maybe exactly. it's self-aware in other ways. Yeah. But we have proof of concept, so to speak. Yes. And that is something given where we started. We started with a particle soup. Particle After soup. the Big Bang, Particle and soup. now we have discovered black holes and yes. the Higgs boson, and God knows what else we will discover. So. Yes. Um, all right. <clears throat> let me see if I can pull one out. Um, uh, what do you think about how do we work together with the proliferation of artificial intelligence and wealth <clears throat> inequality? How? What do you mm. foresee there? Well, artificial intelligence, uh, in my mind, will always have that attribute artificial to it because. I think part, uh, what one has to understand is that intelligence is not just algorithmic thought or rational thought. Our thought process involves three things. Reason, the unconscious mind, and the emotions. And only mm -hmm. those three together are mm -hmm. uh, what we call human intelligence. Mm -hmm. If you take just one piece, the algorithmic piece, it will be artificial and therefore limited in scope. When you look at how Einstein, and Einstein was very candid about this, how his ideas came up. He said that they all came up for the unconscious mind. They kind of bubbled up to the surface, and his gift was to grab it the moment it does, because it's, yeah. a, it's a fleeting phenomenon. It's a fleeting phenomenon. That's and, why I yeah. always try and write. Exactly, I and he was and very good at kind of scooping it up. Uh, we have no algorithm to explain how that part of the mind works. It's questionable whether it's even describable mm. as an algorithm because we know that certain things are not describable mm. algorithmically. So mm. so we have to figure out how to describe the objects. Maybe, maybe the, it's not possible. Or, or, That's the thing. It might, I, think, I think it might not be, but I, I do think it, it is because if the way that a car is currently perceiving its environment yeah. is, is already available to us, then what about um, seeing if there's a potential way to, um, to compute creativity, which mm -hmm. is what Maya does. Yeah. 
So uh, you can certainly do things with that, but I would never equate it to human creativity because there's a level beyond which uh, all of this stuff is programmed. Somebody had to think of a, of a kind of framework within which that would emerge. Uh, now, that is ultimately a human product. You're looking at something much deeper. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Jung's analogy of the mind as, as an iceberg, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where you have an iceberg that sits in the ocean and the, the part that's above is the, is, the, yeah. is the conscious mind, then you have the unconscious, conscious, then yeah. you have uh, the collective unconscious, which mm -hmm. is the ocean in which it floats. Mm -hmm. Uh, if that exists, what is that ocean? <laughs> yeah. And how on earth do you turn that into an algorithm? Rhythm, exactly. You know, that's that, yeah. that that that's where I I kind of philosophically draw the line. Now, I think we have to think through the consequences of artificial intelligence uh, of the kind that we can produce, mm -hmm. because that'll cost jobs. Correct. Uh, it, and and that will create an upheaval of of I think of a magnitude that we have not experienced. Correct. Before. Correct white collar jobs are going to go. Yeah. And then what? Yeah. And we should think along the lines of what Norway has done. Norway basically said, okay, when that happens, there will be a lot of excess money. Who gets that money? If a small percentage gets that money, then everybody else gets thrown under the bus. If we share that money that's created through this, then mm -hmm. yeah, there may be fewer jobs, but some of that money will help these people bridge the gap. And, and I think that's how we have to think. And we're training for the new work. Yes. There will be new work yes. in these fields. Yeah. Uh, there will be new work, uh, but a lot, and a, a, a lot more will go. A lot more will go. I uh, so totally you have agree, to yeah. think about that discrepancy. Yeah, and how do we make yeah. sure that the social fabric doesn't get so disrupted that we have a revolution or a war? Yes, Yeah. because right. if you cross that uh, critical boundary, that, that's a danger. Yeah, I got nothing to say. We got we're out of time, but I mean I mean I do, but um, yeah. Ron's got a lot to say. Well, about bring it, it so on. Do. People so gotta die. You know, you talked about humility <laughs> earlier. We have to embrace uh, death as life, and um, just uh, I hate to say it, but you know, live and let die. Speaking words of wisdom, Paul McCartney says, "Let it be." Mother Mary, comfort me. I don't, I don't know what to tell you, but we have to look at death as an, not an end all, as, as part of life. And we have to understand that we, ha we are 7.5 billion, but we need to get to 500 million and uh, keep it there. And I don't know how to get there. That's, that's a but, low um, number, <laughs> yeah. 500 million. Yeah. Well, I, I, you're right. Uh, nobody, nobody but us are taking away jobs. You know, the, the uh, immigrants aren't coming for your jobs. Uh, it's just sure. us. It's our evolutionary process. And, and uh, uh, I, I can't say anymore. <laughs> because I, I'll volunteer. You know, the, I'll be the first one to say, hey, I'm a useless human being. I had a good time. Uh, let me go first. I, I'm, I'm happy that we're starting to unpack this at the end. This is a whole nother episode mm -hmm. of, of conversation. Um, you know, you, you bring up the point of education throughout mm -hmm. the conversation and, you know, we care about that a lot. How do we get children to understand the age that we're about to mm -hmm. enter and how to get yep. them trained properly? Um, and how do we make sure that social fabric exists mm -hmm. to foster their um, actualization, but also to foster collective prospering, everybody prospering. So that we had uh, interdisciplinary aesthetics with symmetry and asymmetry. We talked about mm. the uh, religion and science. We talked about chaos and order. Yeah. Um, we talked about quantum mechanics and string theory. We talked about uh, quantum entanglement. We talked about yeah. we talked about so many things. Polymathic education of the and Jesuits. no politics. Imagine that. And no politics. Yeah. Imagine that. We didn't yeah. even touch on politics, this yeah. whole conversation. Deliberately. Yeah. Deliberately. <laughs> so definitely yeah. keep that in mind as you think about what just happened. Yeah. There was zero references to any political conversation. Sure. And we had very good thought-provoking conversation about society, about history, about where we're going, mm -hmm. all that stuff. So, um, so keep that in mind as we move forward in the world, is that we can have really great conversations that are not yeah. about CNN versus Fox News and, Absolutely. That, and that polarization. Um, okay, so you have some books coming out, so we'll, mm -hmm. you know, we'll get those links in the bio once they're available. We'll throw sure. them in there. Um, we'll put the link to the current book um, from 2012 in the bio mm -hmm. for people to check out. 
Um, Alex, we hope to have you on the show. My again, pleasure. Again soon. This was so much fun. It Thank was. you. It was. Um, you have a good time? Wonderful. Yeah. Good. Yeah, let's do it again soon because we have yeah. so much to unpack. We'll yeah. have to have another are, call as well. These as, are great questions. Eh? Yeah, oh, we have so much more. I, I, <laughs> your mind is really great for the show. You, you know you have a good, that you have the breadth and depth. It's very important to have. Guys, thank you for tuning in. Share this content. We need you to share it. Okay? Share with other people, get them inspired, get them thinking these, about these in multivariate and important questions to talk to other humans about. Subscribe, hit that subscribe button, join us. Comment below with your thoughts, give us a like. Join us on Patreon, we need help. We need help supporting the studio, our electricity, our rent, our internet, our food. We need to grow the team, we need to make more video clips, we need to do all this stuff, we need to, we need to really do it. Patreon.com forward slash simulation series. Thank you, Ron Vargas, our producing partner. Thank you everyone for tuning in, and we'll see you tomorrow.